Our next lecture is going to focus on the concept of molecular orbital theory. Up to this point, you should have already seen certain fundamentals of quantum mechanics, all the basic models, particle in a box, harmonic oscillator, rigid rotor, uh, as well as key uh, concepts in atomic structure, such as hydrogen atom or hydrogen-like atoms, including the associated uh, atomic orbital angular momentum levels, S, P, D, F, etc., and the associated energy levels and how they depend on the principal quantum number N. The idea behind molecular orbital theory is that we're going to carry over those atomic orbital concepts into the molecular electronic structure realm to try and gain an, a fundamental understanding of what electrons are actually doing inside molecules. To begin with, we assume that the nuclei in a molecule are fixed in space and that we may can just consider the motions of the electrons, at least for a given moment in time. Um, now, let's start with the simplest possible molecular example, which would be the hydrogen molecule ion. This is H2 plus. So we have two protons and only one electron running around between them. The two protons, as I said, are fixed in space. We're going to call the two protons A and B. And there is some fixed distance, capital R, between the two of them. We're ultimately going to vary that R, but imagine for the moment that R is a constant and that our lone electron is able to move in three-dimensional space all around those two protons, A and B. Sometimes it's going to be closer to proton A, sometimes it's going to be closer to proton B, and hopefully, through a simple molecular orbital description, we're going to have a, a basic concept of how that electron allows the two protons, A and B, to be bound together. Now, if you recall from fundamentals of a hydrogen atom, the ground state of a hydrogen atom it corresponds to a 1s type orbital. Now, when we describe the angular components of a 1s type orbital, we describe simply a sphere. I stress that this is just the angular parts of what is really a three-dimensional wave function that consists not only of two angular components, but also a radial component, r. And so this is a distribution of the potential positions of an electron it as according to the two angular components in space. We also uh, looked at the radial component of the 1s wave function, and if you recall, as a function of r, the distance of the electron from the nucleus, and capital R, the radial wave function, for a 1s type orbital in particular, we saw a simple exponential decay meaning that the maximum position, uh, excuse me, the maximum in capital R occurred at the nucleus. That does not necessarily imply a probabilistic interpretation. For that, we need a radial distribution function. But for now, just recall that the shape of a 1s radial wave function looks like a simple exponential decay, right, between 0 and infinity, right, for the position of the, the distance or radius of the electron away from the proton. Now, I'm going to take a 1s orbital like this, angular and radial components, and I'm going to place it, one of them, on A, proton A, and I'm going to put another one, equivalent, on proton B. But now, no longer can I worry about just positive values of R, because if I have a positive direction away from, say, proton A, say, in this direction, I can also go to in the other direction. Right? So I have an exponential decay, again, in the distance away from the proton as the electron moves further and further away, an exponential decay uh, in any direction away. So let's take a cut, a planar cut, through this plane that's identified by the board, and let's think about the wave function associated with A, just the radial part of the wave function, like we did here for a single hydrogen atom. In that case, a 1s orbital centered on proton A can have, again, I'm talking about a distance r, in either direction away from the, the proton, I can have an exponential decay in that direction and an exponential decay in that direction. And indeed, in any direction in three dimensions away from my proton A. I have a similar structure for proton B because if I center now a 1s function on proton B, I have a similar exponential decay for the interaction of the electron with proton B. 
it's going to get the wave function is going to decay as the electron moves further and further away from B. But what happens in between? As the proton moves away from A, I'm going to see that same decay in the corresponding 1s orbital centered on A. But eventually, it comes in range of proton B where there's another exponential and the wave function increases. In this region, if I imagine that what I've just drawn here is a sum, a linear combination of a 1s orbital on A and a 1s orbital on B, then I'm going to call that wave function a linear combination, psi 1s A, and I'm going to assume a positive sum, for now, with a 1s orbital centered on B. Because of that positive sign, and assuming that both C1 and C2 have the same sign, then there's a region immediately in between protons A and B in which the two 1s orbitals, one on A and one on B, engage in constructive interference. In other words, they build each other up. So from this summation between the two, even though A is decaying to zero rapidly, B is decaying to zero rapidly, in this region, they support each other. Again, it's a, a constructive interference. So their sum might look something like that. So there's my sum, psi 1, between the two. Now, I assumed, and again, I'm going to call this wave function psi 1 to correspond to that. However, I made the assumption that this is a positive sign and that C1 and C2 have the same signs as each other. I didn't have to do that. What if instead I chose a different linear combination of psi 1sA and psi 1sB in which I simply change the sign on B? Let's draw that now. Again, I have protons A, proton A here, and I have proton B some distance R away from it, right? Now I still have my, I'm going to take psi 2 to be C1, psi 1 S A, but this time I'm going to take the opposite linear combination with a negative sign in between. Again, assuming C1 and C2 have the same overall sign. So psi 1 S A, since it's still positive, I see the same exponential decay moving away from the nucleus on either side. But for B, now it's a bit different because now I have a negative sign, which means the value of the wave function below the axis is what I see. Now B is negative everywhere. It has the same shape, right? But it's just negative everywhere because of that negative sign. Now in the region in between A and B, even though 1s on A and 1s on B have the same basic structure independently, in this region now I have destructive interference because the positive region of A overlaps with the negative region of B, and so they cancel each other out, at least partly, which means that the sum shown here in Psi 2 might look something like this. You can probably draw it a bit better than I did, but the key point is that directly in the middle, the wave function Psi 2 goes to zero because of that minus sign and because of that negative sign in between, because of that destructive interference. We refer to that point, just as we've done for other quantum mechanical problems, whenever the wave function changes sign in some region of space, we refer to that as a node. These two functions now we can interpret as a bonding type function because the probability of finding the electron in between the two orbitals, which depends on the square of this function, is positive, but over here, now we have a zero in the wave function, which means we also have a zero or a node uh, in the probability function, which would be psi 2 squared. This we would consider anti-bonding. So on this side, I have a bonding orbital, and here I have an anti-bonding orbital. Each of these orbitals has a certain symmetry associated with it. Because I'm bringing together two spherical 1s functions, now I'm thinking about the angular components of the wave function. When I bring them together and they overlap, the overall wave function has cylindrical symmetry in three-dimensional space. The same thing happens here. Now I'm bringing together 
to one S type function centered on each proton, but in this case, one of them has the opposite sign, which I'm going to show by simply having it darkened in. Positive sign, negative sign, that's just a convention. When I bring them together, I still get the same destructive interference, but the overall orbital, psi 2, has cylindrical symmetry associated with it. That cylindrical symmetry means that we're going to use the same kind of, of uh, label notation that we had before for cylindrical symmetry. These are called sigma type orbitals. For a bonding orbital, we simply use sigma, but for an anti-bonding orbital, just to give it a special notation, identifier, we usually put an asterisk to it next to it and call it a sigma star type orbital. So now I have a sigma bonding orbital here from the positive combinations of my two 1s functions, and I have a sigma star anti-bonding orbital here from the negative combination of the two same 1s functions. There's also a symmetry aspect to this, a very important one. I have two identical protons in my H2 plus molecule. There's no difference between the two, except that I've labeled one A and the other B arbitrarily. But because they're identical in nature, and the electron is equally likely to be found hanging out next to A as it is next to B, that means that there should be a symmetry in this wave function. That symmetry means that C1 and C2 must be equal in magnitude to each other. So or the way I've written them here with positive and negative signs, C1 and C2, I'm going to say that their absolute values have to be identical. That's because of the symmetry of the system. In this case, because I have two identical protons on either side of my origin, right, or the plane in between them, we refer to this symmetry as parity. If I take my wave function, which you can view either from in terms of the radial functions or these angular functions, as I pass from one proton to the other, if the wave function sign does not change when I pass from one to the other, then this is referred to as gerade, for the German uh, term for the positive parity. positive parity, or in the case when I pass from one to the other, the wave function changes sign, but is otherwise identical in value, this is referred to as ungerade, or negative parity. The symbol for each of these, again coming from the German notation, for gerade we use g, ungerade we use u, and we add these as extra labels to our sigma notation. On the left-hand side, our sigma bonding orbital, which has gerade or positive parity, we label that as a sigma sub g. And in the anti-bonding sigma star case, which has ungerade or negative parity, we label that as a sigma u. Now, keep in mind, I only get to talk about parity and the, the symmetry of it because I have two identical nuclei in the molecule that have a symmetry relationship. They must be treated on equal footing here. If I have a heteronuclear diatomic molecule, I can't describe gerade versus ungerade parity. I no longer have that what we call inversion symmetry anymore. Okay, so that gives us an idea of the two basic wave functions. And to make an additional point about these wave functions, since we have taken linear combinations of these, positive and negative linear combinations of these, we refer to this as the linear combination of atomic orbitals to give molecular orbitals approximation, or LCAOMO approximation. And it's important to recognize that if I bring together n atomic orbitals, I will obtain, through linear combinations, n molecular orbitals. In this case, I brought together two AOs, two 1s atomic orbitals, and I got two molecular orbitals. If I bring together 10 atomic orbitals, then I can get 10 unique molecular orbitals from them. So those are the wave functions. How about the energies? Remember, 
from the Schrodinger equation, the input to the Schrodinger equation is always the Hamiltonian, and the output from it is the wave function and the energy. We've looked at half the output. Let's take a look at the energies associated with these two MOs. Again, we're going to do this in the context of our individual hydrogen atoms, or the two protons, I should say, coming together from at some distance, capital R. I'm going to have an energy scale here, and I have proton A on the left and proton B on the right. But all I'm going to show now are the energy levels associated with first the atomic orbitals, and then the molecular orbitals. Now, in this case, the only two atomic orbitals I'm interested in right now are 1s. So there's the energy level of the 1s orbital 4 at proton A. On the right-hand side now, I have a corresponding energy level for, for uh, B. The way I've drawn it now, they are infinitely far apart, and this energy is the corresponding energy of uh, a 1s orbital in a hydrogen atom in isolation. Same for B. This is the 1s energy of a hydrogen atom in isolation. I'm not going to put any electrons in for the moment. I'm only interested in what are the general energy levels. Now, I bring these two together, the two protons and their 1s orbitals together. They interact with each other through the LCAO-MO approximation. One of the two orbitals, remember, is our sigma bonding orbital. That's the plus combination of my two separate 1s functions. Then there's the sigma star anti-bonding orbital that is the minus combination of the two. Working through the Schrodinger equation for those two individual wave functions, we can calculate their energies through a means that we're not going to cover here. That's for a separate class. It turns out that the energy associated with the bonding orbital is lower in energy than the anti-bonding orbital. Furthermore, the energy of the bonding orbital is lower in energy than the individual 1s AOs. So down here, for our hydrogen molecule AB, that is, when the two protons are interacting with each other in the presence of the electron, now I get my sigma G bonding orbital, again, lower in energy than the two AOs. And then there is the anti-bonding orbital, move this up, the anti-bonding orbital whose energy is somewhere up here. Okay, let's try that again, just to line it up. That is my sigma u anti-bonding orbital. A point about notation, sometimes if we use sigma u, we will leave off the star because it becomes a redundant notation when it comes to sigma type orbitals, but for the moment I'm going to leave both pieces of that notation together. And to indicate the origins of these individual molecular orbitals, that is, the atomic orbital components of them, sometimes we will draw dotted lines to indicate, for example, that both 1s orbitals are contributing to this sigma g bonding orbital, and dotted lines here to indicate that both of those atomic orbitals are contributing to the sigma u anti-bonding orbital. It also turns out from the, the calculations of the energy, the basic quantum mechanics, that the energy lowering of the sigma g relative to the isolated atomic orbitals is less than the energy raising associated with the anti-bonding orbital relative to the isolated atomic orbitals. So this gives me a schematic energy diagram, and now I'm going to use the same building up or outfile principle that we use when we discuss many electron atoms. Given our uh, energy ordering of the orbitals, we now start filling in electrons. And in this case, since it's H2+, I only have one electron to put in place. Naturally, I want the most stable structure for this, which means I'm going to put it in the lowest energy orbital. So I will put an electron in my sigma g bonding orbital. That I'm going to consider to be the ground state or lowest energy state associated with H2+. I arbitrarily, by the way, gave this a spin up. I could just as easily draw it as a spin down, so the choice was, was uh, mine for that moment. Now. I said that in this particular schematic, I have on the left and far right here, I have my isolated atoms. They're infinitely far apart from each other. And I only get these stabilization and destabilization in the linear combinations when they are in some interacting region. If you remember, I said that at the beginning, my two protons are some distance r apart from each other. And so this is for some relatively small value of r. If, if I choose, I can plot 
the energies associated with the individual MOs, psi g and psi u star, as a function of the distance, capital R, between my two protons. If I do this for the sigma g orbital, I'm going to say that uh, zero is here at my 1s level. If I plot that for the sigma g orbital, again, as a function of that distance, when we're very far away, right, my energy is here. But as I move the two protons and their associated 1s orbitals and that one electron closer together, the energy of the sigma g goes down. But if I get too close, the energy goes way up. So there is a minimum in this function associated with my sigma g bonding orbital. However, for the anti-bonding orbital, I also start out at zero at infinite distance, but as they move closer, they are simply repelled. That's my sigma u star anti-bonding energy. This is an important structure because this diagram looks very much like the sort of uh, diatomic potentials that we've talked about before. There's a minimum in the potential that we will refer to as R sub e, and there is a dissociation energy associated with this. So immediately, if I know something about these energies and the dependence of these energies on the bond distance R, I can calculate simple properties of this H2 plus molecule, such as its equilibrium bond distance and its dissociation energy. Okay, that gives us a very simple and straightforward picture uh, of also a very simple molecule. As I said before, perhaps the simplest molecule, the H2 cation, right, or the hydrogen molecule ion. What if I want to go to more complicated systems? Let's go to slightly more complicated. Instead of the hydrogen molecule ion, let's just go deal with the hydrogen molecule with its two electrons. Now, think about this for a moment. What we did for H2 plus was simply take a 1s orbital on two separate protons, bring them into interaction, allow them to either interfere positively or constructively, that gives us the sigma g orbital, or interfere destructively, which gives us the sigma u star anti-bonding orbital. What's the difference for H2? If we learned anything from the many electron uh, atom Aufbau principle or building up principle was the idea that we could still use atomic orbitals but simply fill in more electrons and, and accept certain shifts in the energy of shells of those orbitals. The Aufbau or building up principle works exactly the same way in this case because if I'm bringing together two hydrogen atoms, again two protons but now with two electrons, I'm still going to bring together two 1s type orbitals. And those two 1s type orbitals in the LCAO MO approximation can either interfere destructively excuse me, constructively or destructively, so a positive combination or a negative combination in this case. So in other words, this diagram, at least schematically without putting numbers on it, this diagram for H2 instead of H2 plus should look exactly the same, except now that I have two electrons, not just one as I did in H2 plus. So since I have two electrons, I can simply add an electron to the same basic diagram to understand the electronic structure in a, on a similar footing as I did for the hydrogen molecule ion. So now for H2, I have two electrons in a sigma g type orbital and no electrons in a sigma u type orbital, and the same general bonding structure holds, though the values of R, E, and D sub E, that is the equilibrium bond length and the dissociation energy, are going to be different because I have two electrons. Qualitatively the same, quantitatively different. So from there, I might write down an electronic configuration associated with H2. This is analogous to the electronic configurations we wrote down for many electron atoms. In this case, I have my one sigma G, which means it's just my first sigma G, with two electrons in it. Very simple electronic configuration for that. But now let's go to a slightly more interesting molecule. Let's go to helium, and I'm gonna draw this separately beside the first one. For helium now, the helium dimer, excuse me, in this case, I'm going to apply the same LCAO MO theory, bringing together, instead of two protons, two helium nuclei, and the four electrons associated with those two atoms, right? Two for each for helium A, two for helium B. But there's still 1s atomic orbitals that I'm bringing together. And for two atomic orbitals, I still get two linear combinations, the plus combination 
analogous to sigma g, and the minus combination analogous to sigma u. So again, schematically for He2, I get the same structure. So I'll draw that. I but in this case now, these are helium atoms. And so the 1s orbital on helium is going to be lower in energy than the 1s orbital on hydrogen. So I've drawn this 1s level lower than the one for protons. The reason these are lower, of course, is because the atomic number of helium is twice that of a proton, right? So therefore, the 1s orbital comes down in energy relative to what I had in H2, but I still form the same linear combinations. I will still form a plus combination that I will call sigma G. The G is appropriate because now I have two identical helium nuclei, so I still have the same parity or inversion symmetry that I did for H2 and H2+. So I have my bonding orbital, sigma G, and I have my anti-bonding orbital here, which I will label sigma U star. But now, since I have two helium atoms, I have four electrons, double the number I had here. I will apply the same building up principle, filling in electrons. I will put two in the bonding orbital, but I have two left, so they're both going to go in the anti-bonding orbital. Now this is an extremely important point about the electronic structure of He2 versus H2. Since two electrons are in an anti-bonding orbital, that means that those two electrons, if you recall, the anti-bonding orbital has a node in the middle and there's destructive interference. There's a region where the probability of finding electrons is low. Actually, it's zero exactly between the two nuclei for the sigma u star orbital. That means that this is not helping form the bond in He2+. And we know that any interaction between two helium atoms is extremely small. This diagram helps us to understand that because not only do I have electrons in a bonding orbital, but I have electrons in an anti-bonding orbital, which serves to partly cancel this out. In fact, this leads us to a definition of a concept called the bond order, which I'll define right here in the middle. The bond order. Simple definition. Bond order is going to be equal to the number of bonding electrons, that is, electrons in bonding orbitals, minus the number of electrons in anti-bonding orbitals, that I'll call n sub a, that difference divided by 2. Very simple definition. Let's take a look at the bond order in H2. Here I have two electrons in a bonding orbital, so n sub b is 2. No electrons in an anti-bonding orbital, so for H2, the bond order is 2 minus 0, which is 2, divided by 2, 1. This is exactly what we would expect, right? If I draw the Lewis diagram for H2, I get something like this. Fulfilling the, the corresponding rule that I want two electrons associated with each atom, including shared electrons, then this is my Lewis structure, and that single line that we use to represent a bond in Lewis theory corresponds approximately to the bond order here, except now we have a quantitative mechanism for assessing it. Let's take a look at the bond order in He2. In this case, I now have two electrons in a bonding orbital, just as I did there in H2, but now I have two electrons in an anti-bonding orbital, so by this formula, 2 minus 2 is 0 over 2 is 0. According to molecular orbital theory, He2 should not be bonded at all. It should be completely separated, right? There's no bonding interaction. In reality, there are weak forces, especially called dispersion forces that we will talk about later, that do allow the two molecules to interact. But molecular orbital theory doesn't take those kinds of weak dispersion forces into account. It's a very simple theory, but it gives us a really qualitative and even semi-quantitative picture of what's happening to the electronic structure inside of molecules. Okay, we've learned a lot just by looking at three different molecules, but let's go on to something a little bit more complex. Let's move down into period two diatomics. Uh, we're gonna move on up, in fact, to uh, those uh, uh, diatomic molecules whose uh, constituent atoms have valence spaces that include also the 2p. So let's go to the, the C2 molecule next, okay, since it's gonna be the first ones that involve a 2p. I'm going to now draw 
a similar kind of diagram, energy diagram, for C2, but I'm only going to focus on the valence orbitals. Remember, the C2 molecule, since it has constituent carbon atoms, a single carbon atom is going to have an electronic configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. The 1s2 is the core. The valence consists of the 2s and 2p components. That's all I'm going to focus on for this energy diagram now. So I've got two carbon atoms, one here, carbon A, and over here I'm going to have carbon B. Ignoring the 1s, now on my energy scale here, my 1s orbital, since this is a carbon and has a very high atomic number, at least relative to hydrogen and helium, my 1s core is somewhere down here below the, bo the board, so I'm not going to pay attention to that. That's not the key part for bonding. It's this region, the 2s and 2p, the valence that matters for bonding. Now, these are identical carbon atoms, right, C, A, and B. So I'm going to place the 2s orbital here, just qualitatively trying to get this. And since they're identical, those two uh, energy levels are the same. They have to be. Again, I have parity between these two. Since I'm bringing together two 2s type orbitals, I can draw a diagram, a schematic diagram, for bonding and anti-bonding in those orbitals, very similar to what I did for the hydrogen molecule and the helium dimer. In that case, I'm going to have a sigma g bonding orbital with contributions from the 2s, and I'm going to have a sigma u anti-bonding orbital also built as a linear combination of the two S's. The sigma G is the bonding, the sigma U is the anti-bonding orbital between the two. I'm not going to fill in electrons left yet. Let's leave that until the very end. Don't forget, now I have a 1S pair of orbitals down way below in energy, the core for each of the carbons. There are also linear combinations of those to form sigma G and sigma U star, just like we saw for hydrogen and the helium dimer. And those, now I need to number my orbitals, right? So the lowest sigma g corresponds to the 1s combination. This is actually my second sigma g. It appears in the valence. So I'm going to give that a label of a 2. So that's 2 sigma g. Similarly, with the 1s's, I have a 1 sigma u star that's already been formed lower in energy. So this is my second sigma u star. So I'm going to put that combination there. I can put that notation on. Now what's happening here with the 2p? I haven't filled them in yet. In the 2p orbitals, for this carbon now, I have a set of three degenerate 2p orbitals. You can think of these, uh, depending on, as you wish, corresponding to uh, m sub l values of 1, 0, and minus 1. I prefer to think of them for this context, since it's no longer a spherical system, but a cylindrical system. I'm going to think about these as px, py, pz, right? So real space representations of the original 2p type orbitals. S uh, carbon A has them, and carbon B has them. They're degenerate, both amongst themselves and between the two carbons. And again, this side is when they're infinitely far apart. This is the interaction region. So this is my C2. Now I'm going to put together combinations of pairs of two p-type orbitals, just as we did before. But in this case, I'm only going to pair up p-type orbitals that have the same orientation in space. And the reason for that is because they have the same orientation, they can yield greater overlap than than uh, orbitals that are perpendicular to each other. Furthermore, I'm going to assume that the carbon-carbon bond axis corresponds to the z axis in my coordinate system, so that x and y are perpendicular to that. That's important because I'm dealing with 2p x, y, and z type orbitals, right? x, y, and z type orbitals. So let's start with the z orbitals. PZ orbitals, since this is the orientation of my coordinate system, the two PZ orbitals are on each carbon atom. I'll draw it here. There's my Z axis. Here's carbon A. Here's carbon B. Right? There's some distance apart. I haven't specified. A PZ type orbital on carbon A, just drawing the angular components of it now, looks like the usual dumbbell. And because this is the positive end of the Z axis, I'm going to say that this is the positive end of the orbital. This is the negative end, and so I will darken it in. Okay? Positive and negative ends. Positive, negative. That's a PZ on carbon A. 
On the right hand side now, I also have a PZ type orbital on carbon B. It has a similar lobe structure. It also has a positive end and a negative end. And since I'm drawing them as the isolated orbitals, there's my positive, there's my negative. That is a 2PZ orbital on carbon B. These are the two that I'm going to bring together in my LCAO MO approximation. So I'm going to take linear combinations of them. I can get two linear combinations out of them, two MOs, because I'm working from two AOs. So my first psi here, which I will call uh, a 2PZ, uh, 2PZ MO, is going to be a linear combination of these two, and it's going to be the plus combination, just for consistency with what we did before for H2 and HE. So I'm going to have my uh, psi 2PZ on A with a coefficient plus psi 2PZ on B with a coefficient. Now, since these are identical atoms, each carbon is, has an identical nucleus, C1 and C2 have to be the same, right? So therefore, this is the psi 2PZ on A plus psi 2PZ on B, but the coefficients in front of them are identical. Okay, again, that's because of the symmetry of the system uh, and, the, and the relationship that we found before. This is a plus sign, right? This is a plus sign between the two, which means both of these PZ type orbitals are oriented exactly as I've shown them, with the plus side towards the positive end of my Z axis. So that's the orientation that this combination implies. I don't have to use that, right? I, instead, what if I take the negative combination, just as we did with the 1S type orbitals for the hydrogen molecule, Let's instead take, there's CA, and now I'm going to take the plus for that one, right? So there's my plus N and there's my minus N. But on CB, I'm going to instead take the negative of the original orbital. So the positive and negative N switch. That corresponds to another, I'll call this uh, uh, We'll call that one plus 2PZ minus 2PZ is equal to C1 Psi 2PZ A minus C1 Psi 2PZ B. Now don't get confused, right, with my notation. The subscript on the first Psi, I used a plus sign in between to denote the positive combination. For this one, I used a minus sign to denote the negative combination. The key point here is when I take the plus combination, I keep the orientation of each of these PZ orbitals in line with the z-axis, positive end, negative end. Here, however, since I'm taking the negative combination, the uh, two PZ orbital on side on B, carbon B, has to be reversed, right? So I switch the sign. Now look at the difference between these two and think again about the concept of constructive and destructive interference. Here, I have a positive lobe pointed towards a negative lobe from carbon A to carbon B. When I bring those two PZ type orbitals together, this positive region is going to cancel with this negative region, and I'm going to have a node in between, right? I have to. I have to have a sign change in between when they finally overlap. But down here, I have a positive lobe pointed towards a positive lobe because of that sign switch on the second term, which means when I bring them together, now I get constructive interference. I get a building up of the wave function and therefore of the probability density between the two atoms. And so we would call this one our bonding sigma type orbital. Now bear with me for just a second. I have more labels to add to this. This one, however, because of the node in between, would be my sigma star antibonding. I used sigma for each of these because I still have cylindrical symmetry along the bond axis, right? Cylindrical symmetry, meaning I don't have parts sticking up asymmetrically out in front and back, okay? So I have cylinders that have funny shapes along the sides, but they're still appropriate to apply sigma to. This is the bonding orbital. The negative combination here is the bonding orbital because of the constructive interference between the positively oriented lobes, whereas the plus combination in this case is the anti-bonding orbital. Now think about parity. Remember parity. We're talking about what happens to the wave function as I pass through the origin in between the two functions. What happens? If I start from this point here in this lobe on carbon A, 
I pass through the origin to the corresponding point on the other side. The sign between the two and the value is exactly the same. However, I start here at this negative end and I pass through all the way through the origin to a point on the opposite side that corresponds to it after inverting the whole thing. Again, the sign and, and value are exactly the same. We would call this gerada, or positive parity. Therefore, I will call this sigma orbital sigma g. Right? That bonding orbital was again sigma g. What happens here, however? Start on this lobe, just like I did down here, in this positive region. Now I'm going to pass through the origin between the two carbon atoms, carbon nuclei, and I'm going to end up at the corresponding point in the other lobe. Right? There's a symmetry between the two. But now the sign has changed. The value is actually the same, absolute value is the same, but the sign has switched. Similarly, I can start at this negative lobe, pass through to the corresponding position in the opposite carbon atom, and I see again, the magnitude is the same, but the sign has changed. So this one has ungerada parity, or odd parity, negative parity. So we give that a label of sigma u. So this is the opposite of what we saw with S-type orbitals. Here it's the negative combination that is the bonding gerada orbital, and the plus combination that it is the anti-bonding Ungerada orbital. So what do I get? Combining the PZs in my diagram, I now get a third sigma G bonding orbital, right? It doesn't matter if you actually attach that to the Zs, those labels, it's not very important, just to show that they're coming from the 2P. And then I have a corresponding sigma U, that's my third sigma U star anti-bonding. Again, those sigma orbitals arise from linear combinations of the PZ components on each carbon atom. How about X and Y? That's where it gets more complicated, a little bit more interesting. I'm going to assume uh, that my X axis, let's, let's erase this and try to extend. For my axis system, there's Z. I'm going to take that as my X axis. Now there are important implications of this. Now I've got carbon A and carbon B. Again, some fixed distance apart from each other. This time I'm going to take a linear combination of PX type orbitals. These are PX because they're oriented along the same direction as the X axis. And you have a positive end and a negative end on each. So this is a 2PX on A and a 2PX on B. I have a choice yet again, just as I did before in my LCAO-MO approximation. Plus combination or minus combination. The coefficients on each have to be identical because of the symmetry of the system. The two carbon atoms are identical to each other. So I can form one orbital that will be the 2PXA plus 2PXB and then another MO that is the 2PXA minus 2PXB. Two 2PXA two plus 2PXB means that I keep the orientation of both orbitals relative to the x-axis. Both positive ends are up in this case. When I do that now, I bring together the two PX orbitals on A and B in a plus combination, right? Now, when I bring them together in interaction, there is overlap between the lobes above the carbon and the two lobes below, that side-to-side -side overlap. We give a special label to that kind of an orbital, orbital, excuse me, a pi label, as opposed to the sigma, which have cylindrical symmetry. So this is a pi-type orbital. Now look, the overlapping portions above these two lobes have the same sign. Therefore, there's going to be constructive interference between those two, just as there's constructive interference between the two negative lobes when they overlap side to side. So that means that this positive combination shown here is a bonding type pi orbital. Okay? That's a bonding type pi orbital. But what about the negative combination? 2p, sorry, 2px still, minus c1 psi 2px on b. This is also going to be a pi type orbital, but let's draw it. There's CA, there's CB. Now I still have my two lobes, but what's different? 
2px on a still has the same orientation as in the first function. So I color in that lower lobe. That's negative and that's positive. But now this one flips. In this case now, the negative lobe's on top. I bring them together in a side-to-side -side overlap. Now this interaction between a positive and a negative lobe involves destructive interference. They cancel each other out in the overlapping region. So there's a node in between those two, just as we saw for the sigma type bonding between PZs. So this one is a pi star anti-bonding orbital. So the plus combination of the PXs gives you a bonding type pi interaction. The negative combination gives you an anti-bonding pi type interaction. How about the last part of the label? Parity. Parity. Now in this case, right, we have to pick our origin, which is the point exactly in the middle of the whole system. Right? There's an origin and there's an origin. Take a look at this orbital, our pi bonding type orbital. I pick a point somewhere in the left-hand wave function. I follow it through the origin to the corresponding point on the opposite side. And I see that the magnitude of the orbital is exactly the same, but the sign has gone from positive to negative. The same thing will happen if I start here, pass through the origin to its partner on the other side, the sign changes. This orbital now has ungerata or odd parity. Therefore, the bonding pi type orbital gets a label of U for ungerata. Meanwhile, the anti-bonding, let's do the same thing. I pick a point. I follow it through the origin to the same point in its partner orbital, and the sign and magnitude are exactly the same. Similarly for the negative region, I follow that through the origin, sign and magnitude exactly the same. This is a gerada, or even parity orbital, so it gets sigma g. So see the difference. Sigma u in this case, excuse me, not sigma, pi u and pi g. In this case, the pi ungerada is the bonding orbital, the pi gerada is the anti-bonding orbital, and this, because, this is simply because of the orientations in space. Now, I've handled this for the x axis. I've brought together two px type orbitals. All I have left now are py type orbitals. But what's the difference? There really is no difference, right? Py type orbitals would simply be corresponding to a plane coming out of the board. So I'd have lobes sticking out of the board and behind the board. I'm going to take exactly the same linear combinations. It all looks exactly the same as these combinations of px to form pi g and pi u, but it's simply rotated in space 90 degrees. Otherwise, they're identical. So not only do I get these same kinds of ungerata and gerata combinations, pi type orbitals, using px, I get identical looking ones using py, just at a different orientation in space. So therefore, bringing all this together and bringing it to my energy diagram. My px combinations will now form a pi type orbital here, a first of all a pi u and a pi g. Okay? But the y combinations will do exactly the same. And because they're simply the same combinations rotated 90 degrees in space, the energies have to be the same. Therefore, I get a pair of degenerate pi U bonding orbitals, and then I'm going to move my C2 label, a pair of pi G anti-bonding orbitals, both of which are arising from combinations of Px and Py orbitals, separate pairs, on each of our carbon atoms. Now you'll note that I have drawn the pi U energy lower than the 3 sigma G. There's nothing I've shown you up here to make you determine that pi u is below 3 sigma g. I'm just telling you that it is. More sophisticated calculations than the sort of simple qualitative picture I've given say that for C2 molecule, um, the uh, pi u is below the sigma g. First of all, this is our first pi u combination, so I'm going to label it 1. This is our first pi g combination, so I'm going to label it 1. Now we've got our schematic drawn our schematic energy diagram drawn, now we need to fill in electrons. How many electrons do I have? Well, as I said before, each carbon atom brings six electrons for a total of 12 electrons in C2. However, four of those electrons are associated with the core orbitals, two in each of the core orbitals for a carbon. They're down here somewhere, so that's four electrons handled. I have only eight left to fill in. 
So let's do so, again, using the Aufbau principle. Two electrons in that lowest energy state of two sigma g, two electrons in the two sigma u. So that's four more. I only have four electrons left. Two electrons then can go in the pi u, and corresponding to Hund's rule, I'm going to put them in pi u with identical spins, one in each of those two degenerate orbitals with identical spins. This would correspond to the lowest energy structure for these. So there's my diagram for the C2 molecule. And from that, I can write down a corresponding um, electronic configuration in terms of the MOs for C2, right, all the way over here. I've got my one sigma G2 and my one sigma U star two. Sometimes we leave off the star, okay? That's a, a variation in the notation, it doesn't matter. Those are the core orbitals that I haven't drawn below, but now I've got two sigma g, excuse me, two sigma g squared, that's that, two sigma u star two, that's that one, and then finally my one pi u has two electrons in it. There's your electronic configuration for C2. All right, now before we move away from C2 and onto, into uh, larger diatomic molecules, let's come back to the concept of bond order in this one. In the, in, remember, uh, bond order is the number of bonding electrons or electrons in bonding orbitals minus the number of electrons in anti-bonding orbitals, that quantity divided by two. Well, in this case, I've got electrons down in the 1s, right, or I should say one sigma g and one sigma u. Well, those are bonding and anti-bonding pairs. They cancel each other out, right, two minus two. Similarly, for the two sigma g and the two sigma u, the bonding and anti-bonding electrons cancel each other out in our bond order definition. But now I have two electrons in a bonding orbital, no other electrons in anti-bonding orbitals, so therefore the bond order in this case is simply one, two divided by two. So my carbon, my C2 molecule, if molecular orbital theory is to be believed, has a single bond between the two carbons, and the other electrons are doing other things, they're in different orbitals the two of them specifically in pi u type bonding orbitals. Okay, let's go on to a another one in our, in our uh, uh, second period. I wanna to go to nitrogen molecule. In the nitrogen molecule, let's think about the differences. What did I do with C2? I took the valence orbitals on each of my two carbons, A and B. I took linear combinations of each pair of symmetry-alike species. I took and an energetically similar species. So linear combinations of the 1s's gave me my 1 sigma g and 1 sigma u star. Linear combinations of the 2s's gave me 2 sigma g and 2 sigma u star, schematically shown here. Various combinations of the 2px, py, pz, where I line up x's, y's, and z's, gave me 3 sigma g and 3 sigma u star. Those are from the pz orbitals. And then the px and py's gave me the pi u and pi g components. There is nothing that I just said there that is specific to carbon, that is to C2. Everything I just described would also apply to N2. So if I draw this corresponding diagram for N2, again, I'm going to have energy levels. But because nitrogen has a higher atomic number than, than carbon, everything will be shifted down somewhat if, if these energy scales are supposed to be identical. Everything will be shifted down. I'm not going to show that because I'll quickly run out of board space, but just keep that in mind, that, that the carbon, the entire diagram shifts downward because of the higher atomic number, or if you prefer higher electronegativity, on nitrogen versus carbon. But otherwise, the same basic structure holds. And just drawing the molecular orbital energy levels, forgetting the atomic orbital components for this, I still have a 2 sigma g, a 2 sigma u star, I still have a pi u, one pi u. I have a three sigma g, excuse me, three sigma g bonding orbital. And then on up here, I have a pi g, that's be my one pi g, and then a three sigma u anti-bonding orbital. Those are the valence molecular orbitals for nitrogen. Again, this is identical to what I drew here. I just left off the atomic components just for the, for the sake of convenience for the moment. They don't change otherwise. But with these MOs in place now, let's fill in electrons. For N2, each electron, excuse me, each nitrogen atom brings seven total electrons. 
Two of those are down here in the core. So that's four electrons in, in two that I don't have to worry about for this diagram. So if there's 14 total, I have 10 remaining that I have to fill in. I will use this using the alpha principle just as before. Two electrons in my lowest energy, two electrons in that antibonding orbital. Now I've got, after that, I have six left. I can get two electrons in each of those bonding orbitals. Again, this is using the same schematic structure as C2, just for N2. I've ignored the AOs on the outside and just kept the MOs in the middle. Filling in all 14 of my electrons, four in the core, the remaining 10 here in the valence. Let's calculate the bond order. Okay, so the bond order of N2. Well, the 1s, right, the, the sigma and sigma star in the 1s, they cancel each other because they have identical numbers in uh, bonding and antibonding. Similarly, for the 2 sigma g and 2 sigma u, bonding and antibonding electrons cancel each other in the expression. But now I have six electrons in bonding type orbitals and none in these antibonding. So that's six minus zero divided by two is three. The bond order in nitrogen is three. That makes sense if I think about the Lewis diagram for N2. The Lewis dot structure for this, we typically show it fulfilling the octet rule as having a triple bond. MO theory agrees. MO theory agrees with this. Here's a key point. Higher bond order equals shorter bond in general. Okay? Higher bond order, shorter bond. You already know this from organic chemistry where carbon-carbon double bonds are shorter than carbon-carbon single bonds. This also holds in the concept of MO theory. It also means Typically, typically, stronger bonds, meaning it takes more energy to break them apart. This triple bond in nitrogen, bond order of three, very short bond length relative to other nitrogen-containing compounds, and a stronger bond relative to other nitrogen-containing compounds, more energy to break it up. So those are important points to remember. Finally, we need to write down our nitrogen uh, electronic configuration, the N2 electronic configuration. For this, I have a 1 sigma g 2, 1 sigma u star 2. Those are the core orbitals that contributed. Now I have a 2 sigma g 2 and a 2 sigma u star 2 that handles the 2s components. Then I get into the 2p components, and I'll just continue on the second line since I think I'm running out of room. They continue with 1 pi u 4 and three sigma g two. So those two lines give me the complete electronic configuration of the nitrogen molecule according to molecular orbital theory. Okay, that takes us through N2. I wanna step over one more in the, period, in the second period from N2 to O2. And to do that, I want to redraw my, my C2 diagrams here because there's an interesting uh, but important change uh, in the molecular orbital structure between uh, N2 and O2. So I'm going to draw the corresponding diagram from N2, and, and, and there's a sort of transition between N2 and O2. I want to stress that molecular orbital theory is that just that. It's a theory. It's a model. And within the confines of that model, what I'm going to show you holds, uh, but I'm not claiming that it's necessarily completely physically relevant. So let's, let's draw the same diagram for O2, with our energy levels here. Again, because oxygen has a higher atomic number and also a higher electronegativity than nitrogen, all of the MOs, if these were on the same scale, all the orbitals would shift downward in energy, right? Deeper into negative energies versus these. I'm not gonna worry about that because I run out of board space. Instead, let's just draw the same basic structure, but the ordering here changes for O2. I still have a two sigma G and a two sigma u star bonding and antibonding pair that arise from the plus and minus combinations of two S-type orbitals on each of my two oxygens. But there's a switch at this point in the ordering of the valence MOs. In O2 versus N2, the next en most energetic MO is actually the three sigma g bonding orbital. And then above that is the one pi u. 
Further above that, the pi g and three sigma star do not change, so their ordering remains exactly the same. One pi g and three sigma u star. So the only switch as I go from N2 to O2 is the ordering on these two bonding orbital pairs, right? The sigma g is now lower in energy than the pi u. I'm not justifying this, except that more sophisticated calculations in MO theory reveal that kind of a switch. So this is within the confines of MO theory. Now for O2, let's fill in our electrons. Each oxygen brings eight electrons to the molecule, so that's 16 total. Four of those electrons are again down in the core below here, so I have 12 remaining that I have to fill in. I'll put four in those 2s components, right? So I have eight to go. Two, four, six, eight. That's a very interesting structure, and it's an important structure because what now I've placed electrons when I get to O2 into an anti-bonding orbital. I should be careful and keep my stars on these anti-bonding orbitals if I'm going to use them at all. So anti-bonding orbitals now contain two electrons. Let's write down the bond order in O2. Again, the one sigmas and the two sigmas all cancel in the bond order because they have the same number of bonding and antibonding electrons. But things get interesting when I get into the 2p valence. I now have six bonding electrons, two anti-bonding electrons. Six minus two is four, divided by two is two. That suggests that oxygen has a double bond in it, right? That makes sense to us to a certain extent, except if I draw the Lewis structure for this, I see the Lewis structure would suggest that all of the electrons are paired, either in bonds or in lone pairs. You should draw the O2 Lewis structure for yourself. But according to molecular orbital theory, I have unpaired electrons. In reality, the O2 molecule itself is what we call paramagnetic. We know this by observing its interaction with the magnetic field. It does interact with the magnetic field, and that's because of these unpaired electrons. This paramagnetic oxygen we can pour liquid oxygen across a magnet and see it be affected. Its trajectory is affected by it as it's poured across. Whereas Lewis structure, Lewis theory, excuse me, doesn't know anything about unpaired electrons, molecular orbital theory gets the structure of O2 right. It's paramagnetism right. So what's the electronic configuration of O2? Well, it's one sigma g2, one sigma u star two. Those are the core orbitals. 2 sigma g2, 2 sigma u star 2, and I'm running out of room here, so I'm going to move it down to the next line. Then 3 sigma g2, 1 pi u 4, and then finally 1 pi g star 2. So there's our electronic configuration of, of O2, and the key difference being the switch in the ordering of the pi u and sigma g, 3 sigma g's and the fact that I have two unpaired electrons, which means the molecule is paramagnetic, which is a physical result. Okay, the last topic I'd like to touch on in molecular orbital theory takes us from homonuclear diatomic, such as the carbon to nitrogen molecule, oxygen molecule, to heteronuclear diatomic molecules. And the one I want to focus on to give you a working example is carbon monoxide. And I'm going to draw the MO diagram in a very similar way that I did to N2, so I'm, I'm keeping the N2 diagram up there uh, for comparison. Now, what's going to change in this case? What's different between our homonuclear and our heteronuclear? Well, obviously we have two different nuclei associated with these number of electrons. I've chosen carbon monoxide because it's what we call isoelectronic with N2. Carbon, which has an atomic number of six, brings six electrons to the party. Oxygen with its atomic number of eight brings eight electrons. That's a total of 14, uh, which is exactly the same number as nitrogen. And I expect the MO diagram to be very similar in structure. A key difference here, however, is that because carbon and oxygen are different nuclei, I no longer have parity. I no longer can label the MOs with G and U, garata and ungarata, for even an odd parity as I did before. So those pieces of the labels now go away because the symmetry of CO is lower. Furthermore, because carbon has a smaller atomic number, or if you prefer a smaller electronegativity than does oxygen, that's going to change the relative energies of the atomic orbitals that they bring in. So if here I have CO in the middle, but on the left I've got a carbon, on the right I've got an oxygen, and the idea is that they're not interacting out here, but interacting here, 
I've got my atomic orbitals for carbon, 1s, 2s, 2p. I also have my atomic orbitals for oxygen that are comparable in shape, 1s, 2s, 2p, but because oxygen has a larger atomic number or higher electronegativity, its atomic orbitals will be shifted to lower energy relative to those of carbon on the same scale. So if I put the 2s orbital, say, of carbon here, there's a 2s, then I need to put the 2s of oxygen somewhat lower. Similarly, if I put the 2p of carbon, say, here, then I need to put the corresponding orbitals of 2p orbitals of oxygen somewhat lower. They're still going to mix in similar linear combinations, but this is going to change which uh, uh, atom is making a larger contribution to a given MO. For example, when I bring the 2s orbitals together in the exact same way that we've already discussed, I take a plus combination and I will get a sigma bonding orbital. Notice I didn't say sigma g because I no longer can apply the Garada label to this because I no longer have identical nuclei. I will also get a sigma u type orbital, which I will label about here. Again, I'm just trying to be qualitative and, qualitative and schematic. There I went again. Sigma u, I just warned you not to do that. I will also get a sigma star, that's the proper label, so stick with me, a sigma star type label. And I've got a contribution here from both of the 2s atomic orbitals that I can label, but because the sigma star orbital is closer in energy to the carbon 2s, carbon makes a larger contribution to the sigma star, whereas oxygen makes a larger contribution to the sigma. Don't forget, I've also got similar 1s core types that con contribute lower, so these are 2s, excuse me, 2 sigma and 2 sigma star MOs. I get similar structures to the two Ps, just as I did for N2 and O2, but carbon monoxide follows the same MO ordering pattern with the pi below the sigma bonding orbitals in the valence P space here. So I will get a pi type orbital, that's my one pi, which comes from the two Px and two Py orbitals on carbon and oxygen. And I will also get the corresponding pi star orbital that is the antibonding combination and I will get a three sigma bonding orbital from the pz negative combination and a three sigma star goodness a three sigma star antibonding combination from the plus combination of the pz type orbitals and again, all of these involve contributions from 2p types, so we will put in all of our lovely dotted lines to indicate where those MOs are coming from. Now I need to fill in electrons. As I said before, I have 14 electrons just like I do with N2, so four of those 14 electrons are contained in the sigma and sigma stars from the core 1s orbitals, so I have 10 more to fill in, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. All of these go into bonding orbitals in the pi in the p pi space versus the 2 space, so I can calculate the bond order for CO. All the, remember, the sigma and sigma star orbitals all cancel each other out because they contain equal numbers of bonding and antibonding, so I only have to worry about this p pi space. Here I have six electrons in bonding orbitals, zero in antibonding, that is exactly the same structure as I had in N2, which is another reason why it's isoelectronic to N2, which gives me an overall bond order of 3, which fits what we expect for, for carbon monoxide. Furthermore, I can write down the electronic configuration for carbon monoxide here. Clearly, I have a 1 sigma and 1 sigma star that are, that are doubly occupied. I have a 2 sigma and 2 sigma star that are doubly occupied. I have a 1 pi that it has four electrons in it, one in each of the px and py pi combinations, and then finally a three sigma bonding orbital with two electrons. There's my electronic configuration for CO. To wrap up, the differences here now primarily come with a loss of parity or inversion symmetry, which means I lose the Garada and Ungarada labels, but the structure is roughly the same in spite of the fact that the atomic orbitals are now shifted in energy somewhat. You can use these kinds of structures, however, to build 
uh, uh, MO diagrams for other heteronuclear diatomic molecules, including those that go through uh, the third and fourth periods and so on, and get a basic understanding of their electronic structure. So that covers uh, all of the, the major points associated with molecular orbital theory, and I hope you found this discussion useful. Thank you.